So I think this promises to be a quite fascinating evening. Please join me in welcoming Ruth Reichel. To some degree, is this book, do you think, fairly representative, maybe, of, you know, our generation of daughters? Um, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, I think I was luckier than most because the thing that I discovered as I was working on the book, and I have to say that working on this was the single most difficult thing I have ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a long time to decide to go and open up my mother's letters and diaries and really find out who she was. But in the finding out, I discovered that she really didn't want me to be her and that she went out of her way to say, I am not a model, you don't have to live my life, my life has been really unhappy mm -hmm. and you can do better. And I don't think that most of us in my generation had that kind of generosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what I discovered in, as I was reading was that her relationship with her mother very much informed the way she raised me. Mm -hmm. And in that she tried to do it differently? She did the opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think her mother who also had had great ambitions which had been thwarted, wanted my mother to live her dreams. Mm -hmm. And my mother saw that nobody can live your dreams for you and that you can't ask your daughter to do it for you. Um, there are many stories of her doing all kinds of, I shouldn't use the word crazy, but crazy things with food. Um, and what kind of an impact do you think that had on your career choice? Oh, there's no question that the fact that my mother um, I mean, was literally taste blind, could not taste. When, no, really, I mean, when um, I, I opened Tender at the Bone with a story of her waking my father up and he gropes his way sleepily into the kitchen and um, she sticks something in his mouth and says, taste this. And um, dad said it was the single most disgusting thing that had ever <laughs> been in his mouth, and my father was, de and he was the most polite European man, and he struggled to swallow it, and he couldn't, and he just leaned over in the sink and spit it out, and my mother went, uh-huh, just as I thought, spoiled. <laughs> and she, she couldn't tell, I mean, she had had to wake him up to find out if there was some, if this food was edible or not, and um, so when somebody is feeding you food that's suspect all the time, you... Maybe they don't want you around anymore. <laughs> you, you learn to taste really carefully. I mean, your, your taste buds become very important to you. And so I focused on food, and as soon as I was able to, I just pushed her away from the stove and said, I'll cook. You know, this will be much better for all of us. And I'm sure that's one reason why food is important to me. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the others is there were so many, um, so many of the things that I might have gone into, which were sort of my mother's realm. Mm -hmm. and to do food, which my mother had total disdain for, was a way of taking something that was really mine. Mm -hmm. You had to forgive your mother the things that you likely have been angry about for quite some time. Well, I forgave her long ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, long before she died, um, our relationship got to a place where I really wasn't angry. I mean, there, there was a moment when I suddenly realized um, I'm not afraid of her anymore and I'm not angry at her. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sorry she didn't have a more fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. um, Are you saying you think she did the best she could given the equipment she had? 
Yes, I, I, I think she really couldn't have done better than she did. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I found these letters to her psychiatrist, actually. I mean, those were some of the hardest things that, because I, I really had thought that she, these episodes, these manic episodes were, I didn't know that she was as aware of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this letter, I mean, I, I, I made a great chapter out of one of her most manic episodes, this party she gave for my brother's engagement. And I thought it had gone right off her back. And then to read this letter to her psychiatrist where she just is, um, you know, full humiliated and he has humiliated her. I mean, that's the other thing that's just so unbelievable to me. I, I keep thinking, would he have treated her this way if she were a man? Mm. It was so condescending. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a one point where she says in the letter, um, he says to her, um, you're so boring. I know what you're going to say before you say it. And you think she paid him to, to say, say this that. to her. <laughs> Just, uh, what can I do as a... Hmm. As a, as a locavore student to promote change? Locavore, yeah, that's... Uh, um, well, I mean, I, I actually think that what's happening in New York now is pretty extraordinary. I mean, you can eat locally all year round, um, and it's probably more interesting than in California where I, I just flew home from L.A., last night, so I, on my way to the airport, I stopped at the farmer's market, and it truly is stunning. I mean, they've got, you know, berries now and all kinds of um, asparagus, this big, beautiful asparagus, and, um, you know, you have to be a more creative cook in New York, um, but um, there are people like Elliot Coleman who are um, teaching us how to uh, grow food all year round in cold climates without using fossil fuels. And, um, you know, it means learning to like a lot of the root vegetables that most of us don't think are the most delicious things. But um, it's amazing to me just watching the growth of the farmer's market movement um, there are farmers markets in every neighborhood in New York City, and um, it's important to support them. And it's important to just go into those farmers markets and make your menus from what you can find there instead of going there with a recipe and trying to make that recipe fit into what's here. It's a different kind of cooking. Hmm. Well, I mean, I've, I've been. I've been writing about food my whole life, and for most of this time, nobody cared very much. And suddenly, food is in the culture, and um, it's in a culture in the culture in a way that I really love, which is people aren't going. You know, it's not all about restaurants now. It's mm -hmm. about going home and cooking and setting the table and inviting people over. And I feel like we're at this place where food as the centerpiece of a family home is finally coming back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of prepared to enjoy this phase very much. I mean, it, it's, for me, it's the silver lining in this recession is it's sending people back into the kitchen. And uh, so, you know, this next period, I'm... Um, I'm prepared to just love it. <laughs> You're looking forward to. So sending them back to the kitchen and very much about relationships, which, it, yes. which, is, um, which is what your book's about. And it sounds like uh, one part of this that you very much enjoy and appreciate. Yeah, well, to me, food is really, I mean, it's not about the food. It's about what happens around the food. It's about the fact that we sit down at a table and we pay attention to one another. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.